Remember the power word. Pray for him. Pray for his voice. He's been struggling with his voice for a couple weeks now. So if you'll pray for him, I know that he would appreciate that. He was debating on whether to try to sing this morning. But even on a bad day, he would sing better than me on a good day. And so praise the Lord for that. You do not want to hear me sing a solo. It would be a sad day under heaven. But uh, take your Bible, go back, if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse 18. It's very noteworthy here as we talk about uh, what has God put you in the church to do? What has God put you in the church to do? Uh, if you'll read this contextually and you'll read this as it is written to a local church, uh, I think sometimes, here's what we do, uh, we read the Bible and we say, oh, that's just written to uh, all believers everywhere. And uh, most of your Bible, you're going to find out, is principally given whereby all believers everywhere are supposed to obey. But here we see in the scriptures some things that are written to the local church whereby God gives us direction as to what we're supposed to do as believers in the local church. Now, I'm going to tell you, I thank God for the local church. Uh, it was in the local church that I was baptized. It was in the local church that I married my bride. Uh, it was in the local church that I learned about child rearing. It was in the local church that I began to understand uh, the reasons and uh, the purposes behind individually participating in stewardship and finances. Uh, it was in the local church that uh, I learned great truths about prophecy. Uh, in the local churches, I would hear preachers get up and preach that God steered me in probably, I would dare say, most of the decisions I've ever made in my life. So I am pro local church. Here's what we understand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, this is written to a local assembly. This is written to a local church. And God is telling some things about what he expects of his people to do in the local church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 18, the Bible says, but now have God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 again as I reiterate it and read it to you one more time. The Bible says, and God have set some in the church, first uh, apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that uh, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. I want us to understand, here's the word set. Now, God uses the word set in the scriptures 600 and 95 times. Uh, it comes from a little Greek word, theo, where also we get the words appoint, also we get the words deputize, we get the word erect, we get the word establish, we get the word commit, we get the word ordain, we get the words sink down, and the words uh, place in a horizontal uh, Zonal position and left there to stay. And so here's what God is saying to this local church. Uh, he says, I have set, in other words, he says, I have placed or I have deputized or I have appointed members uh, in the church, every one of them in the body is that pleased him. Now, if we take that same word and we trace it through our scriptures, we're going to find out why, just using that word alone, God has set members in the local church. Uh, take your Bible and go to John chapter 15 and verse 16. John chapter 15 and verse 16. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you. Now don't forget that comes from that uh, little word again uh, that simply means set or he's affixed or he has appointed or he has deputized or he has established or he has committed. Uh, also you see the word ordained there. So uh, we see this, that God has set us in the church to do what? Well, let's follow the verse. The Bible says, you've not chosen me and I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go, watch it, and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. All right? So God has set uh, us in the church as members and as leaders in the church to do what? He has set us in the church to spread the gospel. Uh, that's what he has set us in the church to do. And that's talking about soul winning. 
comes from that same little Greek word theo, which means to sink down. It means to put in a horizontal place and left there to stay. So God wants you to be a part of a soul winning church. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19, the Bible says this, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and he hath committed there's that word again. He hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20 says this, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled. So God said, here's what I've done. I have passed down, uh, if you would please, a ministry. And the ministry that I passed down to you as members of a local church is this. I've given you the ministry of reconciliation. All right? So one of my jobs as a member of a church is to help people be reconciled to God. Reconciled simply means to be made right. And so my job is to help people to get right or to be made right with their Heavenly Father. Now, we do that through the ministries here. We call it soul winning. And uh, uh, we're ambassadors for Christ. We're in the ministry of reconciliation. We're in the ministry of telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we had 175 that came out yesterday morning to the soul winning meeting uh, that said, I want to go out and tell somebody about Jesus. All right? And uh, uh, we have the bus ministry. I think we run 11 buses now. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, you know, chariots or ambulances, if you would please to go out and pick up those that are sick and bring them into the medical center, which is the local church, whereby they can meet the great physician who is Jesus Christ, all right? And so we understand that God has given us a ministry. Now, he said, I've set you as members. I've set you as members. Uh, that second verse in verse 28, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is talking about leaders in the church. So God said, I've set you as members, and I've set you as leaders. You have a common thing that you are supposed to do, and that is supposed to be the ministry of soul winning. Now, different people get involved in soul winning different ways. Uh, uh, some people get uh, directly involved in it. I tell you, they go out, and they go out consistently. Uh, others uh, uh, will so help to support missionaries and others will help to give out Bible tracts and others will uh, help financially in purchasing uh, more buses or, uh, or, or supporting missionaries and whatnot. But everybody's supposed to be involved in this ministry of soul winning. Uh, there's nothing like yesterday. I talked to a girl by the name of Noon, and she was uh, uh, from Vietnam, and I had the privilege to take the Bible and show Noon how to be saved, and Noon bowed her heart, and she received Jesus Christ as Savior. Then right after that, I had the privilege to show Kevin how to be saved, and he bowed his heart, and he received Christ as Savior, and then went out later in the afternoon and had the privilege to show some other people, uh, and they bowed their heart and to receive Christ as Savior. Now, can I tell you, there is nothing Nothing like showing somebody their need uh, uh, to receive Christ as Savior. Uh, just recently, I was interviewed on the radio station that is 770 AM. It's the KAAM. And they interviewed me, and, and the lady asked me during the interview, she said this. She said, uh, what is the greatest thing that's ever happened to you overseas? You go overseas some? Uh, what's the, ah, I said, the greatest thing that's ever happened to me is to be able to take the Bible and show somebody uh, their need of Jesus Christ. I said, do you understand? There's a big difference between religion and relationship. A person doesn't get to heaven because they're a Baptist or because they're a Lutheran or because they're a Methodist or because uh, they're a Presbyterian or a Church of Christ or Jehovah Witness or a Muslim. Uh, they don't get to heaven uh, because they're a seven-day Adventist. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, oh, they get to heaven not based on religion. They get to heaven based on relationship. Uh, he that hath the Son hath everlasting life. And by the way, you and I ought to be excited about telling somebody about Jesus. Uh, there's nothing uh, you won't get in any more and of emotional high uh, than when you tell somebody about Jesus. By the way, you'll feel good just passing out a gospel track. You'll feel good uh, being able to just express or to share your testimony with someone else. Somebody said this, a soul winner is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Uh, somebody else said this, bringing a soul to Jesus is the highest achievement possible in anyone's 
human life. Somebody else said this, uh, if we make small efforts uh, to win souls, uh, we make small efforts of showing him how much we love him. Now, can I say that we ought to do our part as a church, and we're set in the church to do that. Now, thank God you're in a soul winning church. Oh, I'd rather, friend, I'd rather be in a soul winning church than any other church in the world. You, know, you say, well, it's not a big church. It doesn't have to be a big church to be an obedient church. Uh, you don't win souls to build a church. You win souls to be obedient to your Savior. You, you tell people about Christ to uh, be obedient to that which is the command that God has given to the local church and to the believers of that church. Now, can I tell you this? Can I tell you, we are supposed to set ourselves in a place uh, to give out the gospel that's soul winning. Statement number two, look at John chapter 2 and verse 10. John chapter 2 and verse 10. The Bible says, and he said unto them, every man, uh, it says, at the beginning doth uh, set forth good wine. And uh, when men are well drunk, that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine unto now. Here our Lord is being a servant, and he is setting forth that which is uh, needed for the marriage there. Now, can I tell you here, so what we understand, in the church, we're supposed to give out the gospel. That's called soul winning. In the church, we're supposed to serve. That's what our Lord is doing right here. He is setting forth uh, that which is the good now instead of waiting till the later, if you will, and, uh, or uh, not giving it at all. We're supposed to give our very best in serving in the local church. You know, uh, now, we ought to serve everywhere, should we not? well to serve everywhere but we ought not leave out the local church okay uh, there was a fellow years ago he wrote a book it was called living faithfully his name was John Allen Blair and he told a story in the book about how he was in the Grand Central Station in New York and the wind was fierce the snow was blowing and it was a cold frigid afternoon and all of a sudden he heard a familiar voice and he looked around and there was a tall linky fella by the name of Booker T Washington a ref, uh, renowned educator of his day and he was having trouble as he was leaving the Grand Central Station carrying his book bags that were full of books. And all of a sudden, up beside him uh, ran a, a short, stubby fella. And uh, he said, come here, young man. He said, I'll carry the books. And he picked up the books like they weighed nothing and uh, walked vigorously in front of the young man, asked where he was going, took him to his hotel, dropped the books off. And finally, Booker T. Washington looked down at the short little fella and he said, well, at least tell me your name. I'd like to thank you. Always said, that's not important. You don't need to know my name. He said, I just saw that you were struggling. I don't like to see a man struggling. He said, not when I have the ability to help him. I don't like to see a man struggling. And he said, so you just have a good day. He patted him on the back, almost knocked him down the steps. And he said, you just have a good day. Booker T looked at him and said, well, tell me your name. Tell me your name. Tell me your name. He said, no, no, no. He said, not important. He said, but if you must know, it's Teddy Roosevelt. Have a good day. Goodbye. <laughs> now, he was always, if, you, if you've ever read the stories of Teddy Roosevelt, he was always in a hurry. He was always in a hurry. I mean, he was just always trying to accomplish, trying to accomplish. He talked fast. He ate fast. He walked fast. He did things fast. When he exercised uh, and he went to the gym, he exercised fast. Everything the man did was fast. All right? Now, wait a minute. Here's what we see. But at least he slowed down long enough to serve someone. It doesn't matter how fast you live your life. You ought to realize the importance of serving someone. Uh, it was uh, General Eisenhower one day, he uh, was in the office, and he heard what this uh, other general had done, uh, just a two-star general, and he heard that the two-star general had become uh, very irate at some, uh, uh, at some privates that was in his office, and, and boy, uh, he just chewed him out and chewed him out and chewed him out and said, you're not worth anything, and all, uh, General Eisenhower, a four-star general, uh, he said, now wait a minute, and he pulled that two-star general in, he began to... Uh, uh, come apart on him, and uh, he said, before you know it, I had myself a fistful of general, and I was pulling him up to my nose, and he said, I was chewing him out, and said, don't you ever, don't you ever chew out those buck privates. I'm going to tell you, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have won the war. You know, sometimes we forget that we're supposed to serve. Uh, Leonard uh, Bernstein said this, uh, Bernstein, he said this, Leonard Bernstein, he said this, great conductor, by the way, orchestra con conductor, he said, the hardest chair to ever fill in any orchestra uh, is the second chair. Yeah. 
whether it is the second violinist or whether it is the second flute or no matter what it is, but without that second chair, you do not have harmony. And did you know in the church, it doesn't matter uh, who gets patted on the back, you are important. Uh, in the local church, uh, you say, well, I'm not up there preaching and the light is not shining on me. Oh, but God shines his light on you because you're important in the local church. Uh, uh, when you do your part and you love it, oh, 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 okay, so you're not a bus captain, but you support the bus route. Oh, but you're not a Sunday school teacher, but you pray for the Sunday school teacher. Oh, you don't sing in the choir, but you sit there and uh, when they do a good job, you say amen and sometimes you'll even clap for them. Uh, you know what? that is that is uh, somebody that's given support and if the support was not there somebody's going to get discouraged and somebody's going to quit and somebody's going to throw in the towel and somebody's going to walk away and that's the way it is with your children you know if you would take and support your children you'll get more mileage out of that which is the relationship Oh, but you don't understand. They're making a lame brain uh, type of uh, mm, uh, decision. Well, uh, maybe you can help to guide them, but think of all the lame brain decisions you made. All right? Now, I'm saying this. I'm saying that uh, we understand this. Uh, uh, it's important. It's a, oh, I hope we never get. Uh, I hope we never get snooty in their church. I hope we never get snooty. I hope we never get to the point to the place where we think that we're somebody. I hope that we never get to the point in the place where we think it all relies on us because after all, we're special. No, it should be about God. It should be about His Word. It should be about what God wants us to do in our individual lives. Uh, that's why I tell you some things I like about our church. Oh, there's a whole bunch. I could preach probably two hours on it. I'll not do it. But uh, did you know the friendliness of our church is a no-kill? I mean, uh, I'm telling you, I knock doors all over the place. I talk to people all over the place. And here's what I'm hearing from the community, not from people that come to our church. But people that's in the community, they say, I hear that's a friendly church. And I ask them, well, how'd you hear that? Well, my neighbor visited there. Well, now, if it was good enough for your neighbor, it's good enough for you. But can I tell you, listen, did you know there needs to be some serving going on? Serving going on. Uh, uh, you can't tell me uh, who taught Martin Luther his doctrine when he translated the New Testament. Somebody had to help him. You can't tell me who visited D.L. Moody, most of you, some of you can, but most of you cannot, who visited D.L. Moody in the shoe store uh, that led him to Christ. Most of you don't know his name, but he was important. Uh, you can't tell me who worked alongside Harry Ironside as he was the associate pastor and did a great job, but uh, can I tell you, those that worked beside him made him uh, who he was. You can't tell me the, uh, the, the, the name of the wife of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, but if it wasn't for her, uh, Charles uh, would have uh, got depressed and probably stayed depressed a lot of times as he would enter into those private chambers. And uh, you wouldn't have the penny sermons. You wouldn't have the penny sermons that went out and the sermons that's in book form today if it was not for that wife. Uh, you can't tell me who underwrote financially William Carey's ministry to India, uh, but uh, somebody had to do it. You can't tell me who refreshed the Apostle Paul when he was in the dungeon as, uh, as he wrote his last letter to Timothy. But I tell you, uh, somebody had to be there for him. Uh, you can't tell me who helped Charles Wesley and underwrote him as a hymn composer, but somebody had to underwrite him. Uh, you can't tell me uh, uh, who taught uh, uh, G. Campbell Morgan his techniques. I'm not talking about his doctrine. I said his techniques of uh, pulpit mannerisms, but somebody had to do it. Uh, you can't tell me uh, necessarily who the parents were or the gifted, godly prophet Daniel, but he did have, he did have parents. He did have parents. Now, can I tell you this? Can I say, listen, uh, you don't have to be somebody that's in the light to be appreciated by God. You don't have to be somebody that is uh, um, uh, the voice, if you would, uh, like John the Baptist crying in the wilderness to be used of God. Uh, I'm saying this. I'm saying we're set in the local church to pass the baton of soul winning. We're set in the local church to serve. Statement number three. We're set in the local church to shine, to shine. Now, I'm not talking about shining shoes, though we do that during conference times. But uh, we're set in the local church to shine. Now, what's that talking about? That's talking about your testimony testimony. You know, if we ought to have a good testimony, it ought to be at the local church. Right. What's that mean? Yeah. Testimony means testify with your life. 
That's what it's talking about. Okay, uh, John chapter, uh, well, let's look at Acts first. Acts chapter 13, verse 47. Acts chapter 13, verse 47. The Bible says this. It says, for uh, so uh, hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee, uh, to be a light to the, uh, of the Gentiles, and that thou shouldest, it says, be for salvation onto the ends of the earth. All right, there's that word set again. Something permanent, something concrete, something that we're committed to. What's he say? He said, uh, he said it's there to do what? To be a light, to be a light. I don't know about you, but I thank God for the little light bulbs that's in her house. I do, I do. Uh, 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 the, the Lord's allowed us to uh, remodel my office. And if you've not seen it, I invite you to come by and I'll show it to you. But uh, I bought a light to put on my desk that's a bright light. And I hit that little button, and that bright light comes on. You know, helps me to see better when I'm writing some stuff on that desk. Boy, lights are important. Don't you thank God that when the lights go out, you have a flashlight? Yeah. Don't you thank God for the little light that's in the closet? Don't you thank God for the lights that's on the front of your vehicle as you're driving down the road? Yeah. But, but lights is uh, uh, just like a flashlight, like the will of God. You know, we determine how far we go with the will of God. I said this, I preached in her college chapel this past Thursday, as I do every Thursday. And uh, I said this in her college chapel. I said, uh, the will of God is, it can be easily described or explained as a flashlight. Uh, you turn the flashlight on, and as you're walking, it keeps showing you the future. But when you stop obeying and you stop walking, you don't see the future anymore. See, you're the one that holds up the will of God for your life. As God shows you something and you step into it, then he'll show you more. But if God shows you something and you're a little bit hesitant and you don't step into it, then he's not going to show you anymore. And then you get hung up. Then you get mad at people because you're not moving. Well, it's not people's fault. Uh, you have to keep moving for God to keep showing you more. You ever find this out? Look at all the apostles. Look at the disciples, if you will. Did you find out these were active men? They were active men. They were heavily involved men. They were industrial uh, is type of men. All right? Now watch this, if you will. John chapter 8 and verse 12. Here's what it says. The Bible says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, and he that uh, uh, followeth me shall walk, uh, shall not walk, shall not walk in darkness, it says, but uh, shall have the light of life. So he said, look, I am the light of the world. But he also says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and in verse 5, he says this. He says, ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 14, the Bible says, You are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill, cannot be hid. Over in John chapter 1 and verse 5, the Bible says, The light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehendeth it light. not. What's he saying? He's saying you're simply a light. You're simply a light. Now, you can be a light anywhere you go. And the more God gives you opportunity to shine, the more that you should shine. The more God gives you opportunity to be the light. Oh, please, dear friend, don't let your life be a waste. Uh, there's more to life than education. There is more to life than friends. There is more to life than eating a good meal. You know, one of the things we ought to be concerned about is to find the will of God and to walk therein. Amen. Happy is the person that finds that will of God and walks in it. David Livingston said this. He said, I'd rather be in the heart of Africa in the will of God than sitting on the throne of England outside of the will of God. All right? So uh, uh, we ought to decide that we find whatever God's will is. And most of us in this room, no doubt, especially those that are middle age, have already found the will of God. And you're doing a great job walking in the will of God. Well, don't get sidetracked. Don't get sidetracked. Don't let, uh, don't let the devil, don't let the imps of hell uh, sidetrack you so that all of a sudden you're not doing what you should be doing. Uh, you decide that you're going to be faithful to the cause of Christ until your dying day. Now, how do you do that? Here's what you do. In the local church, uh, you figure out ways to help get the gospel out. Figure out ways to help get the gospel out. We support missionaries. Figure out ways to help get the gospel out. Uh, we send out soul winners. Uh, figure out ways to help uh, get the gospel out.
uh, 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 years ago, there was a, uh, there was a, a fella, uh, uh, Russell Anderson. Russell Anderson said, I can't go to Mexico and, uh, and go soul winning, uh, but, but I can send $10,000 a month down to Mexico and uh, pay soul winners to go soul winning. And so he pays them minimum wage to go soul winning eight hours a day. Well, that's going to be dividends that he reaps in heaven. Well, sure it will. Uh, you know, uh, there is so many different ways to be able to get that gospel out. There are so many different ways. You know, uh, uh, some people, they will go out and, and, and they'll, they'll work a bus route as a worker. Others will go out and they'll work a bus route as a bus captain. Uh, other people will take trips with us as we go overseas. You know, we went overseas recently, and we saw that uh, 7,000 plus bow their hearts to receive Christ as Savior. Well, everybody had a part in that. Did you know that you're reaping dividends in heaven over that? Because those people truly bowed their heart to receive Christ as Savior. I I'm saying this. I'm saying that we're set in the church to go soul winning. We're set in the church to do serving. We're set in the church to shine. One last one, and I'm done. We're set in the church to be steadfast. Be steadfast. You know, uh, when I traveled, uh, my family and I, we traveled together for 12 years going to churches, 12 years going to churches all across America, 12 years traveling the roads of evangelism all across America. And did you know one of the most encouraging things we ever saw in churches across America is when we would go back, uh, people were steadfast. They were steadfast. You know, uh, most of us are creatures of habit. When's the last time you changed where you sit in church? Uh, you might not be in the same seat, but you're in the same locale. There are certain people that like the side from here, and there are certain people that like the side from here, and then there are certain people that like it from here, and then there are certain people that like it from there and there. And we're creatures of habit. Most of us are creatures of habit. Well, you know, because you're such a creature of habit, when all of a sudden you don't show up, somebody misses you. Somebody misses you. You see, I'm saying this. I'm saying that we ought to be steadfast. Steadfast. Uh, Revelation chapter 10 and verse 2, the Bible says, And uh, uh, he hath in his uh, hand a little book, and set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. There's a picture of steadfastness that we see in Christ as he has always been. Steadfast. The word steadfast, it simply means to be unmovable. Oh, listen to this verse. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, the Bible says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, he says, be steadfast, unmovable. It says, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Danny Defoe, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, published uh, Robinson Crusoe, took 20 times of going to a publisher and getting no, no, no. On the 21st trip of going to a publisher, they published it. And by the way, uh, it's been a bestseller for over 200 years. Uh, it's been published in uh, more than 10 different languages. Napoleon, that great uh, uh, military strategist, uh, finished bottom in his graduating class from military school. Uh, there was a fellow that ran for off or uh, had a business and it failed at the age of 22. As I read this, you'll know who I'm talking about. And at the age of 23, he read, uh, ran for the uh, legislative branch and he failed. Age 24, he tried to return to business, tried to kick it up again, and it failed. Uh, then the next year, uh, he ran again for the legislator and it failed. Uh, age of 26, his sweetheart died and he had a nervous breakdown at the age of 27. He thought his life was over completely. At the age of 29, he was defeated as post-speaker of the house. Uh, at the age of uh, uh, 31, uh, he was defeated uh, as an elector. Uh, at the age of 34, he ran for Congress again and lost. Age of 37, ran for Congress again, finally won. Two years later, he ran for the seat in Congress and he lost. Uh, age of 46, uh, he ran for the United States Senate and he lost. The uh, following year, he ran for the vice presidency and he lost. Lost. The following year, he ran for the Senate, and he lost, and the perpetual loser at the age of 51 uh, by the name of President Lincoln became the 16th President of the United States. Why? Because losing did not bury him. 
uh, we have to decide we're going to be steadfast. In 1860, there was a man. Uh, he was 38 years of age. He worked as a, a handyman for his father. He handled all the leather that would come in as a leather merchant his daddy was. He kept the books. He drove the wagons. He handled the hides. He made $66 a month. Uh, before that, he uh, tried to be a sailor. Didn't work. He tried to be a farmer. Didn't work. He tried to be a real estate agent. Didn't work. Uh, he failed over and over and over again, but then eight years later, Ulysses S. Grant became president of the United States. Now, these are men that went through miserable failures, but they finally succeeded. Why? Because they, they didn't quit. They were steadfast. They say that Henry Ford filed bankruptcy five times in a row. Oh, listen to this. Lucille Ball tried out for a script to be able to be a funny lady, and they said, oh, we're not hiring you. You'll never be funny. <laughs> Quaker Oats, bankrupt three times in a row. Pepsi-Cola, bankrupt three times in a row. Bird's Eye Frozen Foods, bankrupt. Borden's Milk, bankrupt. And Jemima, oh yes, bankrupt. On a wintry day, and I'll give you this, and I'm done. On a wintry day in 1850, there was a teenager, and he decided he wanted to go to church. He couldn't make it to his church. The snow was so bad. The banks were so heavy. And he decided that, well, I, I can't make it to my church, and there's a primitive Methodist chapel, and it sounds like they got something going on on the inside. There's people singing. There's people that uh, seem like they're kind of happy. I just think I'll turn in there for just a little bit. So he turned in there for just a little bit. He sat on the back row because he was a stranger visiting the church. He felt quite uncomfortable. Uh, it was so snowy outside, the preacher didn't even show up, so a deacon had to preach. The deacon got up and he opened his Bible to the book of Isaiah. He began to preach with fire. He stepped back, and as he saw the young man back there paying attention, it almost looked like he was paying attention with great urgency, like something was about to happen. He backed up, and he would repeat himself over and over again. And finally, he got bold, and he started pointing his finger at that boy's chest from the front of the pew all the way back to where that boy was sitting against the back wall. And he said this to this young man. He said, you're in trouble. I can tell you're in trouble. He said, uh, uh, look on to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. That's what you need to do. You need to look on to me. And he's talking about Christ. He said, all the ends of the earth and be saved. Oh, and he picked his voice up and his tempo picked up. He said, I said, look unto me, all ye ends of the earth. And be saved. You can be saved today. Oh, and he just got with it. And he started preaching it with great vigor. A deacon did. That little boy sat back there and he heard that sermon. It wasn't long after that that he bowed his heart and received Christ as Savior. Oh, you said, whatever happened to that little boy? Well, he grew up. Little boys do grow up, you know. And he grew up. And as he grew up, uh, he became known as uh, a great pulpiteer in the London, England area. For many years, he pastored. Matter of fact, he started pastoring at the age of 19. Uh, at the age of 19 and a half, the church was growing so rapidly that people were coming in from all over to hear this 19 and a half year old boy preach by the name of Charles Hans Spurgeon. But there never would have been, I don't think, maybe, a Charles Hans Spurgeon had there not been a faithful deacon that was just there. I tell the awful story, it's true, but I tell the awful story from time to time because it breaks my heart, ought to break yours too. John Dillinger one time came to a Baptist church. He was dressed in rags. He's just a little boy. And he came to a Baptist church, and he got ready to enter in. And I thank God that we have a bus ministry, and I thank God you care about people. John Dillinger stood on the front of a porch of a Baptist church, by the way, and he dressed in rags. He had old dirty blue jeans on, had an old ragged shirt on, and uh, he was going to go to church. He was excited about going to church. He thought he'd be loved at church. He stepped up to go in the church door, and a deacon met him. Not like that deacon I first told you about. But a deacon met him at the front porch and he said this. He said, your kind is not wanted here. And Dillinger walked away as a little boy to go back out into the world. 
And he said, well, I might not be wanted here, but one day I'll be wanted. And there was a day when he became public enemy number one because he just wanted to be wanted. That's how it started. Now, can I tell you, everybody ought to be wanted in the church. Everybody ought to be cared about in the church. Uh, that's why we're a soul winning church. Uh, that's why we try to uh, shine and uh, uh, give a good gospel witness, yes, with our testimony, our lifestyle. And that's why we try to serve people. And that's why you and I as Christians ought to be steadfast. Steadfast. Oh, one day uh, I'll get older, older. I'll probably get ill of health one day. I'm not right now. One day, probably I'm going to lie in state. I'm going to be in a casket one day, and uh, people are going to come by, and uh, some people will probably cry, and other people will probably clap. But anyway, I'll be lying in state. No, I'm kidding about the clapping. Don't you be the one to do it. <laughs> I hope that my, my dear wife, and I hope my kids and who they marry, I hope they can walk past that casket one day and say, well, he was steadfast. Amen. He was steadfast. At, 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 at least he was steadfast. He was faithful. He believed what he believed, and he was faithful to the calls. Now, can I tell you, uh, you and I ought to live our life like today's the very last day we'll ever have. Because does not the Bible teach that life is a vapor? It appears for a little while, and then pff, it vanisheth away. The Bible says uh, uh, that we're not supposed to... Uh, uh, if you would please uh, boast on tomorrow. Matter of fact, it says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Now, dear friend, you don't know how many days you got left on this earth. I have preached the funerals of little babies. I preached the funerals of children. I preached the funerals of teenagers. I preached the funerals of middle-aged people and old-aged people. I don't think any one of them had it on the calendar. This is it for me. Today, it's going to be it. Today, about, oh, 1230s or so, I'm going to take my last breath, and it's going to be all done. I'm done. I don't think any of them planned it. But it comes to every man. Because it's appointed unto man once to die. God has an appointed time on your calendar when you're going to die. You can't change that. Only God can. But if that be true, and it is, then we ought to take at least a part of our life and be faithful to the cause of Christ through the local church. That's why these churches, I don't understand them. I really don't. But they, uh, they don't have church on Sunday night. You say, what do you think about that preacher? Shame on you. Shame on you. You don't have church on Wednesday night. Shame on you. Shame on you. Uh, I think people need more church, not less church. I think we need to be more encouraged to live for God, not less encouraged to live for God. I'm saying this this morning. I'm saying that uh, God has put you in the church. Uh, be that soul winning person. Be that steadfast person. Uh, yes, be shining. Yes, you ought to, and be serving. Be faithful as to what God has for you, and God will bless you. By the way, can I tell you what? Those that raise their kids in church, I've never heard uh, 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 that they were sorry. But those that raise their children out of church, I've heard a lot of sad stories. Church is a good place. Amen. Father, we thank you for today.